Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Maximizing Your Workouts. Uh, as the slide shows, this webinar will be presented by myself, George Dorsey, and uh, will be sponsored by Gen X Muscle. And um, we're going to give people a few minutes just to log on to this webinar. So I like to have a little fun in my webinars. And so uh, we're going to watch a little, just a little video just to kind of give people enough opportunity or time to, to log in. So. Come on, buddy. I don't have a Wow. Look at that. We're going to give them about uh, 20 more seconds or so, and then we'll go ahead and start the webinar. You know, I've been going to gyms for about 30 years, and I thought I've seen it all until I've seen this video. And I've seen some weird stuff, but... Um, this is some pretty strange stuff that goes on in, in gyms. All right, we're gonna go ahead and um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hopefully, I didn't see any of you in the, in this video. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, the the objective of this presentation is to help the layperson to understand basic concepts pertaining to physiology, biology, and really how the human body works. Um, our goal with this presentation is to show how an individual can maximize their workouts even while reducing workout time, but increasing results. This presentation will produce questions and we expect that that will happen. But when you do have questions, feel free to give us a, a, a shout out or send us an email at info at genxmuscle.com. Our, you know, our, our reason for putting on this webinar is, is we want you to be successful. Again, I've been in this industry for 30 plus years, and I've just seen people struggle uh, to try to reach their health and fitness goals, and they really don't have to. Once you've established a baseline of which to make decisions and understand how your body works, um, things will come a lot easier for you. So again, this is a basic discussion, so we won't get too far into the weeds, but we will go over some basic concepts, which I think will help to clarify the bombardment of information that we get on a minute by minute basis. And we tend to get this from TV, social media, Facebook, Instagram, you know, anybody with a few thousand followers is a, is a uh, fitness guru or a fitness expert. And it's um, fitness and health is, is a lot more involved and more detailed than just throwing around some weights. And so you really have to understand just, you know, how your body works. And I know that information can be overwhelming. So if I was sitting in someone else's shoes without having gone through my training and my education and, and my experiences, uh, you know, I'd be overwhelmed as, as well. So anyway, we're just going to move forward. And just a little bit about myself. <clears throat> you know, I grew up as a skinny kid in, in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I'm sure there's some video somewhere around of me doing push-ups and sit-ups and, and stretching and what have you not in my mom's living room. Health and fitness was always a big deal for me. I had the uh, G.I. Joe action figures and the uh, comic books that showed everybody with muscles. And I was a skinny kid and, and I didn't have any muscles. So thank goodness that, um, you know, I stayed with it and kept my vision. I really uh, 
understood exactly what I wanted to do athletically. And then also just, you know, aesthetically as well, I know what I wanted to look like, but being an athlete was more important to me. As I got older, I transitioned into the Air Force, into the military. And actually, I just retired about a year ago. So I did 26 years in the military. But um, this experience not only challenged me physically, but it also challenged me mentally. And uh, the two certainly go hand in hand. And I was able to challenge myself, set some goals, and do things that I didn't think that I was capable of doing. So this experience really raised my confidence, but really got me to know more about myself as an individual. So I ended up playing football in a Division I school at Colorado State. That was a great experience as well, understanding that I never played football in high school. I was just a great athlete when I got there. I actually played tennis in high school and then uh, played a lot of basketball in North Carolina and, you know, other places where I, where I lived. But again, I couldn't, um, you know, I, I didn't stay there long because I couldn't stay healthy, but um, I actually had an injury. But again, you know, I, I, was, I was just, you know, challenging myself uh, physically and then mentally as well. And, uh, at, at, you know, during this uh, program at uh, CSU, Colorado State. So here's just some articles, just talks about some of my physical accolades, some of my physical uh, accomplishments. Here they're talking about uh, me benching over 500 pounds. Actually, the article got it wrong, but, but um, benching over 500 pounds, um, squatting 650 and running a 4540 all using organic ingredients, no steroids there, and did everything naturally. So here in the upper left corner and then the lower right corner are pictures with me. I actually helped start a company in 2013 or launch a product in 2013 called Sculpt Inc. And you can Google Sculpt. It's uh, S-K-U-L-P-T dot me is the website, but I'm still on the advisory board for that company. But um, you know, that was a great experience. The uh, co-founders of the company, one was an MIT electrical engineer. The other one was a, um, is a Harvard doctor, and they just didn't have the health and fitness background that I did. And that's what I brought to the table. And they brought me on first as a consultant um, and then also a spokesperson and then uh, as a part of the advisory board. So that was a good experience. And, um, you know, uh, I would, certainly wouldn't change that for anything. And then I wrote a book, uh, The Owner's Manual for Health and Fitness, and that was a good experience as well. And some of the information from this uh, in this webinar is actually pulled from that book. But moving forward, learning without application means nothing, which means that I actually had to apply the things that I was telling other people. Um, I had to use myself as a guinea pig, so to speak. And, and you know, I was, I'm pretty successful in that arena. And these are just some of the uh, things that I did over the last few years, I actually started competing um, as an amateur and then eventually got my pro card in an organization called the IFBB or International Federation of Bodybuilding. And that's the same organization that Arnold Schwarzenegger and Joe uh, Luferino are, are members of. Uh, they do the bodybuilding, I do the men's physique. But anyhow, um, that was, that's, you know, a little bit about my, my past. <clears throat> so, again, fitness is not just about physical fitness, but it's also about mental fit fitness as well. But these are just some examples of how uh, being healthy got me through and how it saved my life. And so, as you can see, my one of my legs is actually swollen. I actually had a blood clot running from my ankle to my groin. And I actually flew from Vegas because I was living in Vegas at the time to Boston, stayed there for a week. Um, Boston back to Vegas and, and then Vegas to North Carolina. My mom saw it and she said, you need to go and, and get that taken care of. And sure enough, it was a blood clot, significant blood clot. And the, you know, doctors looked at it and, and if it was, if I wasn't who I was, I probably would have, probably would have died and had some of that, uh, broken off into an embolism. But, but anyway, um, you know, this webinar is not about me. It's it's about you. It's about helping you to be successful. It's about helping you to reach your health and fitness goals. And, you know, again, I just see people struggling all the time and there's really no reason for it. You don't have to beat yourself up to 
to um, reach your health and fitness goals. And 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 we'll, we're going to talk about um, how to do that uh, as we go through this webinar. So what exactly do you want to get out of this webinar? And again, like I said in the beginning, this webinar is going to raise some questions. By all means, take some notes, jot down some notes, and then send us an email at info at genx.com. Com, I'm actually going to have genxmuscle.com. I'm actually going to have the web address at the end of the presentation. But, but again, just think about as we go through here. If there's some questions that I didn't get to to um, uh, answer, or if you you know if there's actually initiated some other questions, feel free to to shoot those to me, and um, I'll either either send them out uh, individually or send them out to the group. So the agenda today is quite simple. We're going to talk about metabolism. We're going to talk about insulin. And we're going to talk about the heart rate reserve and how to maximize your results for your workout. And really, that's all we need to cover today. So one thing I would just want to step right into is an equation or uh, a terms, or terms called total daily energy expenditure, TDEE. And uh, this represents the amount of energy or calories that our body needs to function in a day. As you can see in the equation, RMR represents 70% of this number. Food, 10%, and physical activity is 20%. So let me just break this down a little bit. The terms thermic effect means that this is the amount of energy required to do something. So as the equation shows, the energy that the activity of eating, processing, or digesting food takes up about 10% of our energy and exercise takes up only 20%. So let me say that again. Exercise only takes up about 20%. So when we sit around and we talk about losing weight, gaining weight, or just trying to stay healthy, we spend 90% of our time thinking about something that matters only 20% of the time. So really the question is, is what should we try to focus our attention to? Or on, right? RMR, because RMR makes up uh, the majority of, of this equation. So what is RMR? RMR is resting metabolic rate. RMR is simply your metabolic rate calculated four hours after a meal while you are in a rested state. There is also BMR or basal metabolic rate, but we don't need this to talk about this at this time, but I will mention BMR later on in this webinar. So since RMR takes up so much of TDEE, the question is, is what can we do to manipulate this part of the equation to help us to reach our fitness goals? So the answer is we need to manipulate our metabolism, right? Because it's uh, resting metabolic rate, metabolism, right? So the question is, is uh, what exactly is metabolism? I mean, you can read the information on the slide, but basically it's just the it's the breakdown of foods and substrates like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins to allow your body to function. This, all, this term also includes the elimination of waste. But, uh, you know, if anyone needs some clarification on what exactly elimination of waste entails, please send me an email and I can walk you through it. But, um, you know, we can talk about that much later. So let's talk about what factors actually make up metabolism. There's genetics, gender, age, glands, height, body fat percentage, body temperature, external temperature, exercise, nutrition, and weight. And the question is, is which one of these can we actually control? The only ones that we really can control are body fat percentage, body temperature, external temperature, exercise, nutrition, and weight. Genetics we can't change, gender we can't change, age, glands, or height. I mean, we can wear some, somebody can wear some heels, but the, the, their height will still be the same. But anywho, those are the ones, the ones that are highlighted are the ones that we're going to focus on in this webinar, and these are the things that we can really change to affect our metabolism, right? So the first one we're going to tackle is body composition. So as this chart shows, this is just kind of uh, ranges. It gives uh, body fat ranges for men and women based on years of age. And you can also see to the far right, 
when you reach a certain body fat percentage, it is what is considered uh, obese. So body composition is important for a number of reasons. Um, through all of your hours of exercising and sweating, this is really your main goal. How much you weigh means absolutely nothing. So often I hear people say, oh, I lost 10 pounds or I lost 20 pounds. Um, but what exactly does that mean? You know, and especially if somebody says 10 pounds or fat, is that 10 pounds of fat or is that 10 pounds of muscle? So one important fact that you need to know about this is, is that uh, when you just diet alone and you don't do any resistance training and you don't increase your protein intake and some other things, um, you, you actually, for every pound loss, you actually lose 30% muscle. So if you ever want to go over to like Whole Foods and see a lot of people who have lost dr drastic weight and they look emaciated, um, they look weak and frail, um, they don't have any muscle tone, um, yes, they uh, you know, may have lost some weight, but they've also lost a lot of muscle mass, and this is really counterintuitive. So, um, you know, and, and actually some people may look uh, normal, as far as their weight is concerned, but they may have a high percentage of body fat, and that's called skinny fat or m metabolically obese. And, and I'm not going to cover that in this, this, in this presentation, but, but I can cover it in another one. But notice that I didn't say BMI, and a lot of people throw around this term BMI. Um, and, and BMI is, is, is not a uh, body, uh, you know, body mass uh, index is not uh, body fat. BMI is a poor indicator of fitness or, or body composition. And the reason is because BMI doesn't take into account muscle mass. Basically, it just looks at your height and your weight and then you divide it and it gives you a ratio, right? And uh, for me, I've always been overweight based on BMI measurements and that's why it's inaccurate. So, um, you know, so BMI, we're not talking about BMI, we're really talking about body composition. So the best thing you can do as an individual is to, is to determine exactly what your body composition or body fat is. And then once you've established that, then you can set your goals as to what you want to be and, and where you want to go with your exercise uh, program. So, um, you know, and then another thing too is as far as uh, body comp composition is concerned is those with higher muscle mass as compared to those with lower muscle mass burn more calories. So one of the questions I always get from, from people and especially women and, and you know, for the, for the men that are on the webinar, uh, you know, the, the, the concept is the same, the people are different, um, but a lot of people or women come up and say, I want arms like Michelle Obama or, or Angela Bassett. Um, and they want to be toned. And I've, I've had some men say I want to be toned as well. But the word tone comes from the word tonus. And tonus means a slight continuous contraction of muscle fibers or groups. And so, uh, you know, basically in order for your muscles to have a slight contraction, it takes energy to do that, which means that your body is using ATP, which is what our bodies use for energy through the breakdown of macronutrients such as carbs, fats, and proteins. So basically, in order for your, your, your body to look toned, it's burning calories. And that's why I say that uh, those who have higher muscle mass and, and have a, a toned look um, actually have a higher metabolism th than those who don't. But there's another important part about body composition uh, because research has shown that those with a higher ratio of muscle mass recover quicker from cancer or other metabolic ailments and also have a lower incidence of diabetes, CBD, etc. So the question is, is why is this? Well, it's because your body, is re when it's repairing itself, it's actually looking for amino acids which are stored in your muscle fibers. So your muscle fibers actually act as a reservoir for, for these amino acids. And if anyone has ever been through cancer or a similar ailment, their doctors will tell them to significantly increase their in intake of protein. And usually that runs about three to four times what an average person would take. So, so again, amino acids and protein is, is, are, are very important for those who are, you know, trying to rebuild. And then not only that, one, one thing I do want to talk about, and I need to make a note of this for future references, is that uh, as we age, we go through a process called sarcopenia. And uh, sarcopenia is basically age-related muscle wasting. So as we grow older, our bodies are actually naturally losing muscle mass. 
So again, it's very important for us to maintain a certain body composition and, and really be focused on increasing our muscle mass and our muscle tone to ensure that that uh, you know we're reducing the age-related effects of, of muscle wasting. And then again, if you just diet alone, you're going to be losing a lot of muscle mass uh, as far as weight loss is concerned as well. So another thing about body composition is you have to also understand that there are two types of muscle fibers, and, and those are important as well. So a type two muscle fiber is like a sprinter. Like if you've ever seen a 100-meter or 200-meter uh, sprinter, uh, they, they're more muscular. Uh, they look thicker. Um, that's because those are type two muscle fibers. Those, those are, you know, for power and explosion, but not only that, they actually, um, uh, take a lot of energy to use or to utilize. Uh, if you look at a type one, uh, uh, individual or, or, or a person that has a type one, uh, muscle fibers and, and everybody has, um, a certain number of, of various, uh, muscle fibers. It's just that one is more prevalent than the other. So in a marathon runner, you'll see people who are thinner. They're, they're a little bit more frail, if you want to use that term. And those are type one muscle fibers. So really what you're trying to do is you're trying to increase your type two muscle fibers or make those bigger because actually the number of muscle fibers that we have are really set when we're uh, around adolescence. So, um, but again, we're really trying to focus on those type two muscle fibers. So let's roll over into the next factor that we can control, and that is body temperature or external temperature. So your, your body temperature is, is so important to fitness, um, you know, I can't say enough about it. So 98.6 is the optimal temperature for your body to perform at its best to include metabolic processes, but also understand that um, your core temperature matters the most. And in order to try to get your core temperature, it's, it's a more intrusive type um, process. So you can't get your, tor uh, your, your, your core temperature by sticking a thermometer in your mouth and, and you know, going to the doctor. It doesn't work like that. But anyway, just as a baseline, understand that your body is always trying to maintain homostasis by staying at 98.6. <clears throat> But, you know, again, uh, temperature matters. So if your body temperature reaches 113 degrees, not only do certain metabolic processes stop, but you could also die. So it's important to understand where your body temperature is at, right? Um, and then also understand that your body is always trying to get you back down to that 98.6 or get you up to that 98.6, depending upon what the external temperature is or your, your uh, internal temperature is. So when you get into a very cold climate, your body uses energy to try to increase your body temperature back to 98.6. And a couple of ways that it does it is through a process called thermogenesis. So if you recall, if you think, you know, the last time you went into cold weather, your body starts to shake. Well, those are actually muscle contractions, right? And your, and your body's actually uh, using energy uh, to, to create heat. And that's what that is. And so again, when it's cold, your body's trying to get your, your uh, body temperature up to 98.6. It's going to do that through, uh, you know, continuous muscle contraction. And then it, and it, and it actually uh, burns uh, brown fat or uses brown fat in that process. But we don't, again, we're not going to necessarily go into detail on that at this point. And then there's another way that you can get to thermogenesis by the ingestion of certain supplements or, or certain foods. Um, so again, that would be non-shivering thermogenesis. So also understand that when you get in the hot weather, your body is trying to use energy to cool itself, right? And it's doing that through sweat and perspiration. And so again, your body is always trying to maintain this 98.6 temperature by either cooling itself down or heating itself up. But what happens when you go to most gyms, right? So most gyms, they actually will, um, uh, you know, ha turn their temperatures down to like 70 degrees. And the goal when you work out is to increase your body temperature, right? 
And if you're not sweating, then your body is not using calories to cool itself. And, um, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit more about that a little bit later. But the first thing that people do when they get to the gym, they start taking off their clothes. And that is counterintuitive in the fact that you that's not what you want to do because you end up cooling yourself down immediately. And there's some very important concepts that you need to know as far as why this is wrong. But as you can see on the slide, a one degree increase in your core temperature increases your me metabolic rate by 10 to 13 percent. A one de degree decrease decreases your metabolic rate by 10 to 13 percent. And, and it takes you, um, in order to burn a one pound of fat, you have to burn 3,500 calories. And so, so again, heat is very important in working out. So uh, when you see me at the gym, I'm usually covered up. Uh, I may have some shorts on, but I've got a hoodie on. And when I do my cardio, I'm, I'm, I still I keep that hoodie on because I want to sweat. And, and again, we're going to talk about why that's important and, and, and what the reasons are for, from behind that. But um, so let's scoot over to the next slide. And, and this is where we kind of get into some of the weeds, right? Is, is that if you look at a, uh, you know, take out a stick of gum out of a pack and uh, you try to bend that stick of gum, you try to, you know, uh, stretch it, it, it breaks. And that's how your muscles operate. But when you take that gum and you chew it and you warm it up and you got some fluids going in it and you slobbers in it and then you take and you take it out and then you try to bend it, you can stretch it. You, it's, it's more pliable, right? Your, your, your muscles act the same way. So uh, heat is important. Uh, it reduces when your muscles are warm, it reduces the risk for energy, uh, <laughs> injury. And, uh, and also there's two important, uh, words that you should know. One is vasodilation. The other is vasoconstriction. So when your body is warm, your blood vessels dilate, they open up and that's good because certain nutrients, um, you know, certain waste, the, the flow of these things are actually increased because of the dilation of your blood vessels. When you're cold, the opposite happens. They constrict. And so that reduces the amount of, uh, you know, flow of nutrients and oxygen and, and uh, you know, waste um, from your, to and from your muscle fibers. So again, temperature is important. Um, external temperature is important, which means that I normally don't work out in cold weather unless I'm fully clothed and I've got, you know, layers of clothes on to make sure that I'm staying warm. Um, so again, temperature matters and it, this is what we can manipulate to try to increase our metabolic rate. So let's roll over to nutrition and... <laughs> This is what we call the first rule of thermodynamics. And basically what this says is, is that energy that is not used um, cannot be destroyed. It's going to be stored. So just understand that that is true for the food that you eat. So if you're eating more than what you're supposed to be eating, which is energy, right? It's going to be stored into fat. And I don't care whether you're eating salads all day whether you're eating grass all day, whether you're eating steaks or, or hamburger all day, the concepts are the same. And the fact that um, if you're overeating, it's going to store. And I've never seen uh, too many uh, uh, skinny cows. And all they do is uh, eat grass all day, right? They eat all day. And that's why they're so big and so muscular and just so powerful is, is that they eat all day. And again, they're not eating steaks and what have you not and ice cream and, and whatever, like it doesn't matter. So um, understand that point as well is, is that all calories matter. And we're going to talk about um, how to calculate that number and how many calories you should be taking later on. So 
This is called the Harris, or I'm sorry, the uh, basal energy expenditure or Harris uh, Benedict equation. And this basically is um, one method of trying to determine exactly how many calories I should be consuming in a day. So I just did this as an example. So this says that I should be taking in a, a little bit over 3,600 calories a day based on my activity level and some other factors, right? My gender and, and weight and whatever. And so, and, and some other factors. But, but as you can see, I've broken down that 3,600 calories into proteins, carbs, and fats. And the fats are at 60% of that number. The carbs are very low and the protein is moderate. And there's a reason for that is because the reason why my carbs are so low is I am uh, close to an Atkins diet or even a ketogenic diet. But why that's important is because um, I'm trying to manage my insulin response. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying not to uh, have my body store body fat, right? And, and we're going to talk about insulin in a little bit. But understand that I'm actually going to eat less food because I'm concentrating my nutrition mainly on fats and not carbohydrates and protein. And the reason is because for every gram of fat is nine calories. So I can divide that 3,600 calorie, uh, calories by nine and I can reach that number faster. So as you can see, 60% of my fats uh, equal over 2,000 calories, right? And then protein at 30%. So protein for every gram of protein and for every gram of carbohydrates, it's only four calories. So fats is, is double, double the calories for carbs and, and protein. But again, I'm eating less food during the day because I'm increasing my intake of fats. I'm reducing my insulin response to carbohydrates. And I'm maintaining my protein to ensure that I'm getting the appropriate amount of amino acids. Uh, in my body. So again, it is a numbers game. You got to really know your numbers. And once you understand how many calories you, you should be taking in, it, all you got to do is set a baseline and then you can work from there. You don't have to do this every day and say, oh, I can't have this or I can't have that. Um, you know, it's, it's just really not that dramatic. So let's talk about uh, heart rate reserve and, and, um, why this is important. So, you know, heart rate reserve is important because when you see people go to the gym and they're working out and they're reading a book uh, on the treadmill or the bike, but they're not sweating and they want to post on social media that, hey, I did six miles a day, but they don't tell you that it took them three hours to do it or four hours to do it. Right. And um, that's really not where you want to be. You really want to push yourself so that you're actually sweating and you're inhaling um, and exhaling heavily. And I'm going to talk about why that's important. But here, what you want to do is you want to measure your heart rate reserve. So when you go to a, a, a cardio piece of equipment on the um, uh, console of the equipment, it'll say, uh, take 220 and then subtract your age from that number. Well, and then they say, this is your maximum heart rate. And then they put you in like this fat burning zone. But the problem is, is that uh, is not specific to you. And that's why it's a problem. It's, that's not way to do it. And that's why you uh, measure your heart rate uh, reserve because that's tailored directly to you. And what that does is it uses your age, but then it also uses your resting heart rate. So in this example, I actually have two 20 year olds, one with a resting heart rate of 50 beats per minute and the other one was with a resting heart beat of uh, heart, uh, resting heart rate of 75 beats per minute. And as far as intensity, we're going to say we're shooting for 40% of heart, heart rate in, uh, reserve. And 40% is kind of where you start off uh, sedentary individuals, right? If you're a little bit more active, we, we put you, you know, we try to put you up a little bit higher. But anyway, you uh, do 220 minus age, that gets your heart rate max, but then we do the heart rate reserve calculation and we come up with 40% uh, at 110 beats per minute. And then the other individual who is a little bit more sedentary, has a higher heart rate, 
uh, resting heart rate at 125 beats per minute. So that person is going to have to work a little bit harder uh, as far as, um, you know, their cardio program. And also understand that females are going to have a heart rate or a resting heart rate of 10 beats on the average, 10 beats uh, per minute higher than males. That's normal. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, some terms out there, but uh, there's one called tachycardia. And uh, that just means that your heart rate is beating so fast that, you know, there may be some issues. Um, uh, and then there's brachycardia. But again, we won't get into the weeds on those. And uh, when I'm exercising, I'm really shooting for 85% of heart rate reserve or 90% of heart rate reserve because I know that that's going to get me in my fat burning zone, so to speak. And, um, uh, and as the chart shows here, as the, as the slide shows, 85% is 178 beats per minute for this individual. Mine is not that high. Mine's actually a little bit lower. But I know that I'm going to do uh, 20 minutes at that rate that I've calculated for myself. And as you start to get become more healthier, you'll notice that your resting heart rate will actually lower. And that's important because that means that your heart is beating less to move the same amount of blood. So I think, you know, everybody has around five liters or so of blood. And, and so that means that at a higher resting heart rate, your heart is really working hard to push that blood. But when you become more healthier, your resting heart rate lowers and your heart is not working as hard. And actually, I had a, um, I had a, uh, a meter because I was worried about uh, sleep apnea and, and, you know, so I don't have anybody looking at me at nighttime and saying, hey, you stopped sleeping. So, so I got this monitor and it uh, measured SpO2 levels and it also measured my heart rate. And I set the alarm at around 40 beats per minute. So if I knew that my heart rate would drop below 40 beats per minute, that the alarm would just wake me up. And, um, and that would tell me as to whether, you know, I wasn't breathing or not. And then all of a sudden the alarm went off and scared the crap out of me because uh, my heart rate actually went below 40. But that was because I was running all the time and I was just becoming healthier and it just scared me. And my heart was just really not beating that heart while I was sleeping to pump the same amount of blood. And, and that's really what you want to happen is you want your heart rate to or your heart not to work as hard. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's actually a positive thing. So, so here are some tips that I have for you. Again, like I mentioned, control your insulin, understanding that insulin, which directs the muscle and fat cells to take in glucose, right? So glucose is what you consume. Glycogen is how it's stored and cells obtain energy from glucose or convert it to fat for long-term storage. So again, Understanding the first rule of thermal dynamics is, is that you, your body will store this excess glucose, right? And it'll tell your body to store when you eat this carb when you eat those carbohydrates or foods that are high on the glycemic index. And you know, things like rice and white rice and breads and stuff like that. All that stuff is high on the glycemic index, and that increases the insulin response in your body and it tells your body to store. So we want to stay away from those, especially if we're in a weight loss situation. And then we want to determine what our TDE is. And, and basically, that's how many calories we should be consuming in a day, right? And that's going to give us a baseline. So we know that if we go under that number, that's not necessarily good, but it's not bad. But we know if we go over that number, that's certainly not good. And it certainly is bad. Um, and so that allows us to understand exactly how many calories we're supposed to be taking in, but then we break that down by carbs, fats, or our macronutrients, carbs, fats, and proteins. And again, if we're in a weight loss situation, we want to try to lower our carbohydrates so that we don't uh, uh, manipulate that insulin response. And again, we're getting close to an Atkins diet or even a, a, a ketogenic type diet, but you know um, we're not going to go too far in the extreme. And Determine your heart rate reserve. That's something that we talked about as well, because you always want to put yourself in a situation to where you're um, sweating, you're exhaling, you're actually working. 
Um, and again, for me, I actually only need to do cardio for 20 minutes once I've measured my heart rate reserve because I've learned to shorten my workouts. I don't need to do 30, 30 minutes an hour of cardio. It's ridiculous. I don't have time for it and, and nobody really has time for it. But you can get a better effect uh, a short amount of time by doing about 85 to 90 percent of your heart rate reserve within that short period of time. You'll burn more calories in that window of time than somebody reading a book um, claiming that they did 10 miles on the treadmill. Trust me, you will. And then one important thing is the metabolic window. Basically, that's that's a window of time after you get finished working out. And it's important to understand uh, what that means and the fact that you have about 30 to 40, 45 minutes after your workout to eat some really good foods for recovery. And what people tend to do is they consume a whole bunch of carbohydrates or a smoothie, right? And that's counterintuitive because now you're telling your body to store and you're jacking up and increasing the insulin response in your body. And that's just not um, the way to go. What I tend to do or what I suggest or recommend is, is that you take in um, proteins and fats after you get finished working out. And, you know, there was a there was a huge push by some gyms. I won't say the names, but to drink chocolate milk after you get finished working out. And there was banners up in the gym saying, hey, drink chocolate milk is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And the problem with that is, is that study, because I have it, was based on research done by a swim coach who was a coach of 20 something females and they was swimming all day you know, for hours, training, practicing. And then what they found was, is that after practice, they would consume chocolate milk instead of a Gatorade or a Powerade. And they, and they actually were able to uh, store more glucose as glycogen um, than they would, uh, you, know, you know, by drinking chocolate milk than they would drinking Gatorade or Powerade. Well, that's good for 20-somethings if you're swimming hours for the day, but for somebody who's 40 or 30, um, you know, that's not good. And especially somebody who's in a weight loss situation. So, um, that's, again, that's counterintuitive. And, and so you have to watch things and that, I know that whole, uh, program, uh, or effort was pushed by the dairy association based on their research. And they really put some dollars behind that to get people to drink chocolate milk. I love chocolate milk, but I don't drink it now because I just understand it's, it's, it's really not the best thing for me. And not really the best thing for a lot of people, but but it's, it's so much sugar uh, in in uh, chocolate milk, regular chocolate milk. But um, again, another tip: control your carb carb carbohydrate intake, lower carbs, higher fat, and moderate protein work, and understand that it takes more oxygen to burn fat than carbohydrates. And there's a chemical process process that actually happens when you burn body fat, and um, you know, body fat is reduced down to CO2 and then also H2O. So that means that the majority of your fat is excreted through your exhalation, your sweat, and then your urine. A small percentage of as it leaves your body in your urine. And the thing about that is, is that if you're not sweating, if you're not exhaling, if you're not inhaling, if you're not breathing heavy when you're working out, then I highly doubt that you're losing weight or burning fat, right? So again, oxygen is important in that process and that chemical process to burning fat. So you really have to work hard and push yourself. And again, understanding that if you're measuring your heart rate reserve, uh, you'll get there. And you're, if you're doing about uh, 85 to 90% of that number, then you'll certainly get there. Um, so anyway, those are the tips for this particular presentation. I actually went a little bit longer than expected. But, um, you know, hopefully this is uh, some good information for you. And again, that's our agenda that we just covered today. And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, shoot me an email at info at genxmuscle.com. We'd be more than happy to, to answer your questions that you may have. And hopefully this information was helpful. I know it's been helpful for me uh, that, you know, once I understood just how my body worked and how carbs, proteins, and other things, and, and the things that I can manipulate as far as my metabolism. Um, you know, uh, once I figured that out, then everything for me just got a lot easier. 
and I'm sure that it will get a lot easier for you too. So thank you again for attending this, uh, attending this webinar and uh, we'll post some more videos as we move forward. Thank you much.